Okay. Okay, I'm going to kind of take a cue from Angela, but I'm going to do the opposite. Um, I find that I'm a little tall for the podium, so I'm taking my shoes off. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why I decided heels were a very good idea. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here at Interact 2019. It's really uh, fun to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce myself a little bit and then share lessons I've learned along the way. And I want us to think for a few minutes where design is going. Design is going in light of the environment. Where is design going in light of burgeoning technology like AI and machine learning? I know it's a lot, but we're not going to go into anything really deep. What I want you to think about is how you bring some of these practices to bear and to how you can go into depth on your own when you're thinking about how to approach your products or your teams. All right, so um, my background uh, is in uh, graphic design, uh, like Angela, I think. Uh, I uh, have been in there with uh, very traditional graphic design methodologies and trained in fine art as well in philosophy uh, and I have a degree in English literature so who is going to think that I end up in software. Uh, I spent a lot of time in traditional publishing so I have done uh, books and magazines. I did high-end documentaries on CD-ROM, a company called Corbis that was owned by Bill Gates where uh, before we did Stockhouse uh, which uh, this uh, background told me the importance of creating those emotional hooks, some of those editorial and filmic sorts of attitudes. And I haven't thought about this for the longest time, but I was when I was at RGA, I did the very first medical site with Novartis, and it was uh, sort of unheard of for pharma to have any sort of presence in the internet and any sort of conversation with consumers. So I haven't thought about that for a long time. Uh, so. This is the first lesson then. What you need to bring when you think about your reader, your viewer, your user, is you need a sense of storytelling. So that's the first lesson. But it's also a way of thinking about galvanizing and motivating a team. So whether you're managing or whether you're leading or whether you're dealing with stakeholders. Especially with stakeholders, it's a way of bringing them along your journey and what you're trying to achieve with your team. My background's in software, so I spent uh, 15 years at Microsoft, all told. Uh, I was uh, the user experience director for Microsoft XP. Uh, I was the first director to combine research with content, with design, and understanding that we needed that quant and qual, and I'll talk about that a little bit. I started the first ethnography team at Microsoft. I was at Office 365 and I shipped the first cloud offering for, for Microsoft and then uh, worked on Microsoft Surface. This was the, I don't know if people remember this, but it was called the Big Ass Table. Uh, <laughs> and it uh, was the first time that Microsoft, well, and a lot of other uh, people in technology were exploring multi-touch. So how do you uh, do, this was uh, through occlusion. But how do you handle the social and the mechanical of having multiple people interact with a single surface with their hands? Um, I've lived in Thailand, in East Africa, in South Africa, in Jamaica. And I've lived and worked in Idaho and Utah, in Seattle, New York, uh, Chicago, and in the Bay Area. And so uh, all of this uh, for me meant I really loved uh, travel and learning new languages and cultures. So it's not uh, surprising that I ended up at Booking uh, to, uh, to be able to live and work overseas. If you ever have an opportunity, definitely take it if you uh, have a chance to go to new countries and new kinds of businesses. I know Booking.com is not the best looking site nor the easiest to use, but there's, there's a reason. Uh, <laughs> There's a reason that I'm there. So <laughs> I'm part of a design leadership team that was brought in to really change things, to change the way we thought about product, to change the way we think about uh, approaching user experience. Booking was built on years and years and years of optimization. It is A-B testing to the max. And it is done by very independent teams 
who manage about this much of the experience. And so we are now moving to a place where we can use optimization to some point, but we've learned that we have to think much bigger because even I, I think about stakeholders, I had uh, one of the SVPs tell me what I know, I mean, he's literally saying, I know, I know, that what got us to where we are now will not get us to where we need to be. And for a long time, Booking was very successful. Booking Holdings made $14 billion last year. And so they have a lot of faith in this methodology. So we're gonna to have to work through change to make sure that we provide the right kind of support for customers and the right kind of support for the employees. So what do we think about when we think about what customers really want? So what they want is quality and meaning. We need to start thinking about authenticity and what quality means to them. They crave things that are meaningful and relevant, something more than what the actual product experience may provide. So we need to think about things like Lloyd's here in London is uh, providing new services and new insights to make things easier for people to save money and manage their life and manage their money. It's a whole lot more than thinking about banking as a place to manage your credit card or your checking account. And things like smart thermostats, smart cars, helping you save energy. So going beyond the intrinsic experience. And it's also a brand differentiator. You have to think about how the quality and experiences offer that kind of human insight and advice and recommendations that we can bring from AI. And AI and machine learning will help sharpen those insights and bring those to a more human level. So what is it gonna take for us to do? So now I'm back to the title of the talk. For those of us who've been around for a while and anytime you go to a new company, you've got to learn that it's not going to help if we start being very arrogant. You know, if you know, I'm the designer, this is the way it's going to be. And we can't complain that, hey, I want my seat at the table, it's not gonna work. You have to earn that respect. So you need to earn respect and build that attitude that is going to be more positive and more complimentary to, to your stakeholders. Because playing the victim hasn't got us to where we need to be, right? Anybody tried that and it really kind of backfires? So, but it doesn't address root cause problems and it doesn't advance the story for design. So neither does it help to sort of be the hero that comes in and save the day. Because what that does is teach people the wrong kind of lesson and it doesn't build advocates, it doesn't build collaboration and relationships and it certainly doesn't scale. You can't have somebody always coming in and working 24 hours a day and having these beautiful presentations, you can't sustain it. So yes, customers' expectations have grown and there is new technology out there, but we need to think about leadership principles and management skills that are going to bring us forward. So uh, how do we get there? One of the first things we need to think about, and this is probably the most important lesson that I've taught to any researcher, writer, or designer. It's a business. We have to think about revenue. We have to think about profit. We need to think about brand loyalty. And we need to be very strong in fiscal and organizational management. To be effective in our careers, we have to think about how to be thoughtful about our budgets, thoughtful about how we manage our resources so that we have the right kind of tools in place. Uh, somebody, one of my colleagues at Booking, when we're talking to people who want to move into leadership positions, we said, okay, now be careful of what you're gonna get into because the number one tool for design directors and VPs are Excel. All right, so what do we need to do to help build this? First, it's a coalition of user experience. If you can build your strong allies with people writing copy and doing content development and doing research and build that strong partners, it is a coalition that can stand the kind of stressors that organizations can put on you or that product management can put on you 
and yes, this is the Seattle Seahawks. I was lucky enough to see them uh, here at Wembley. But you know, that's what I think of is, is that kind of strength that you can get from those kind of numbers. And then it brings us to the next, next point. But really, we need to remember design is a team sport. And collaboration with all the other disciplines in the business, along with user experience, or the, is going to be the way for us to get ahead. You want that healthy balance of technology and product and user experience. And you even want to encourage healthy debates. Those kinds of tensions are uh, healthy when you get the opportunity to figure out what levers are you going to push and what, things, what outcomes are the most important. So think about what you're doing to build rapport and to build relationships with the people that you work with. All right, so related to this is when you think about the balance of tech and product and user experience, and you think about the relationships you're building, it's really important that you take the time to make sure you're on the same page, that everyone is aligned. And you do that through co-owned principles and metrics and priorities. So that way you know how to do the right kinds of decision making, you know how to do the right kind of resource allocation, and it sets the standard for quality together. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. All right, so when you think about your own leadership style and you think about the people around you, self-awareness is a very important leadership trait. You have to think about where you admit mistakes, how you seek feedback, how you start managing perception and feel comfortable showing some vulnerability. And this is probably a very tough lesson for a lot of people. I certainly know it was for me. But good leaders know how to manage their strengths and their weaknesses. They know how to ask for help. And they know how to bring people around them who are actually stronger and more skilled at places where you might be weak. And one of the reasons, sorry, I've been traveling a lot, so I'm very dehydrated. One of the reasons it's important to think about being self-aware is that you want to establish for you and for your team a growth mindset. And a growth mindset, how many have heard growth, growth mindset? Okay, awesome. So it's the position that is better to inhabit a position of learning and constant improvement rather than stick with a fixed point of view or a fixed set of skills. So if you think that you're always growing your career and your team should always be growing and the way your approach to product should always be evolving. Uh, Carol Dweck from Stanford University has written about this a lot. And she reminds us that in the growth mindset, failure can be a painful experience, but it doesn't define you. It's a problem to be faced, dealt with, and learned from. And statistics show that especially for creatives, that impediments and challenges help us grow the most. So lean in to times where there is opportunities for you to grow or to help one of your colleagues grow. And for your teams, start setting expectations of year over year growth. That means for yourself, for your teams, for individuals, you expect more for them the following year than they did in this year. And you can do that by setting meaningful and relevant challenges so that they're stretch goals are achievable and meaningful, and you're helping them marry their aspirations with where you need to take the team and the product. And we have to communicate those insights. So we need to be really good about having breakthrough conversations. We need to be very comfortable with candor and let people know where we stand in an appropriate way. You need to be transparent about your values and your expectations and the observations that you have. This is a dialogue that you want to, and you want to make sure you're listening for other people's point of view and that you're providing that timely feedback and gratitude to those around you. And even if it's critical feedback, but one of the things you want to make sure that you keep yourself honest with is that if you are managing someone or you're going to give someone uh, very critical feedback during a performance cycle, you want to make sure you do that early. You want to give a chance for people to have a course correction if they are not going down the right path. 
it's not fair to anyone for you to hold it back and surprise them during their, their performance review. And another way to, uh, to think about role modeling the right behavior is avoiding gossip. Now for me, it's, it's a slippery slope. I've been guilty of it myself and it feels good for a time but really, if you can think about how you model that for your entire team and avoid it altogether and encourage people to talk with people instead of about people. So in our environment, uh, it's pretty fast paced and there's ambiguity and change everywhere. And that introduces stress. But we have to be comfortable with the grays. We have to think about how we embrace the unknown to be adaptive, to be flexible, and to be able to make decisions without all the right information. That's what leadership is, and that's actually using design-centric sorts of thinking and analysis. So that remember that anytime you're feeling that ambiguity and change and stress, those are opportunities, and there's opportunities for innovation, for you to build your career, for you to bring some clarity. So as you go about doing your job, Think about, am I asking clarifying questions? Am I helping move the team forward? Am I breaking down this ambiguity and showing the right kind of leadership and strength that it will take to keep the team moving forward? And so another thing to think about is, are we at an inflection point? Is this an opportunity for us to rethink the product, to rethink the team? And so what I think about is, how do we show Elasticity. I think about it when you are in design, you think about the big picture and you think about the strategic point of view and you think about the whole. Then the next minute you're sweating the details of every pixel and every word. And being able to go back and forth is a unique skill because designers and researchers and copy need to think about that. So this is what I call elasticity. Get really good about going back and forth and know what kind of altitude you're functioning at. So think, what kind of conversation am I having? Whether it's with designers or your stakeholders, am I having a strategic conversation or is this about iteration and polish? But again, get comfortable going back and forth. So courage and conviction are very related to principles. They're very related to self-awareness and storytelling and responsible design. And we'll talk about responsible design in a minute. But you must have a clear point of view. Take a strong stand so that people don't know where you're coming from. And this kind of strength and conviction is contagious. It helps bring people along with you. They know how to have their own kind of uh, way of approaching their fears and ambiguity. Designers can be very strong change agents. And so using courage and conviction, using influence without authority can help move the team forward, help move the product forward. But it's our job to take a stand and have a strong point of view about where the business should go, where the experience should go. If you want to be a leader, whether you manage or not, this is a very important trait. So one way to check in on your career one way to check in about where you're going from a product point of view is to make sure that you're taking time every week, it's what I call a, a weekly audit. I've got to the point where it's just kind of rote. I do it first thing Monday morning. I have calendar time blocked off so that I can think and ease my way into the week. But I ask myself, are there, is there a product or feature set that aren't going in the right direction? What am I going to do about it? Have I been avoiding having a very tough conversation? Well, I've got to get that on my calendar. Is there anyone who needs that course direction? Is there a superstar, someone doing great work that I haven't expressed the right kind of gratitude and recognition? So this is a, a practice that will think about where you need to go this next week. And is there a place where you need to roll your sleeves up and jump in and say, I'm here to help? Also, this is a time to spend maybe once a month a little time on your own career. Where are you going with your trajectory? Am I meeting my own goals? Is this time for me to do a reset? And because if I'm not going where I need to be, what am I going to do about it? So now let's turn to AI and machine learning a little bit. And we think about how design uh, plays there. 
So in technology and in industry, there's been a seismic shift. So this is an example of a cotton factory, very hand labor oriented in the past, but now robots are taking over. So what does that mean? Connected devices can communicate with each other and they can automate a lot of functions that are critical to moving businesses forward. But in fact, people are worried that this is going to replace jobs, that people are going to be out of work. Deloitte did a study that says 800,000 people were displaced by robots and automation. Yet, they said that 3.5 million newly high-skilled jobs were created. So I think there's going to be a role for design and research to play when we come to how we're going to look at the larger picture of AI. So Dr. Kai Fu Lee was a colleague of mine at Microsoft. Uh, he's an AI expert who did the first speech recognition software. He looks at it this, if you want, you can find his TED talk um, on this very subject. And I wrote to him and I said, can I steal basically, uh, I recreated it, but still steal this idea from him. So AI is not something to fear, it's something that is going to take over repetitive, boring jobs. And uh, I have a colleague who says, when you get back, I have a bone to pick with you about these slides because I shared them with him. He said he believes that design is gonna be more, uh, more affected about automation. But Kai-Fu Lee's position is that from a creative and a strategic point of view, you will always need humans that are gonna do that kind of interpretation. What he says is AI cannot analyze, synthesize, empathize, or realize the way humans do. What he says is machines can't love. He goes on further to speak about how AI can support these routine jobs and, op and optimization. So that you see a lot of very repetitive, boring things, yes, AI can help with that. But he points out that compassion and creativity are always going to be human endeavors and that creativity and strategy are gonna be the differentiators on how we make AI and machine learning work for us. So there you see that here's some of the areas that are related to us. Customer support will take advantage of it. Translation <coughs> certainly takes advantage of it right now. Image recognition is becoming more and more common. But if you think about research and the role of design, we'll always have a place where we bring that human interaction, that human emotion, and that high touch to bear. So think about what skills and behavior you want to bring in so that you're making the right kind of recommendations, the right kind of insight. Because what you want to do <laughs> is think about when you're offering information and recommendations and insight, and you're trying to be transparent where you get that data from, do you want to be the creepy guy this is, uh, I talked to an AI expert uh, the other day and he said, I just, I want to keep from being creepy. I want to, to, people to love the recommendations that I advise. So I said, I think of that as being your personal concierge. I think about that at booking right now when you think about things. So if you could think about your favorite concierge who is proactive, who understands you, who offers the right kind of insights and recommendations, that's what AI can do, but it's going to be managed and presented well by design. But I'm super happy that Angela talked about this as well. We want to be data informed, not data led. I think that uh, we've got a lot of uh, different kinds of methodologies and data streams that we need to take advantage of. I call it concatenation triangulation, there's other words for it. But you want to have a mix of data streams that you make your decisions from. So that is quantitative, that leads to machine learning, but also qualitative that feeds into our insights and make sure that you're doing this across a diverse audience so that you can bring your, the best to bear with your products. So we need to use all of our creative and technical skills and going back and make sure we're thinking about root problems, discovering unmet needs, and delighting customers. And to do all of that, you're going to need a mixture of data from that very intimate to very large data sets. 
So how do we do that? As designers, we have obligations, opportunities to bring technology and product goals together in service of customer and in service of the brand. So we learned we have to be strong collaborators, we have to be very business oriented, and we have to produce the kinds of experience that, that bring brand recognition. Because I will argue with brand and marketing people all the time, and I said, but the product is the soul of the brand. It's not logo types, it's not packaging, it's the experiences that you build. So remember, you are a big part of creating that brand loyalty. So we have to think about where do we want to be high touch and where do we want to use the power of automation? So it's our job to connect the dots along those customer journeys that, that Angela spoke of. And that means thinking about marketing and brand, the actual product experience itself, email and other communication, and even customer support. It's our job to curate those moments of truth. And what are moments of truth? They're where the points in the customer journey where you have an opportunity to delight someone or an opportunity to detract. So this starts getting into nuances that uh, end up in things like net promoter score or other sort of brand loyalty indicators. So even now, more is expected of us and design can rise to the challenge. Not only do we provide accessible, meaningful and relevant experiences, we need to also think about where we avoid dark patterns in our AI. We will do it in a way that looks beyond the actual experience, beyond the intrinsic experience of the product and the immediate experience you're offering. So agile lead and lean and optimization have led us, yes, to much faster iterations. But we need to slow down a little bit. We need to be more planful so that we are understanding more what the long-term consequences of the products we make and the product decisions we provide. We can do a better job of avoiding pitfalls as gender and racial bias. We have to look out to see what happens with these, these uh, machine learning models. We have to think about doing ethical reviews and thinking about what positive outcomes we're trying to create and what negative outcomes we want to avoid. So here's the last principle. Think about Kai-Fu Lee's call for human compassion and love. What is design's role in the future? What is the key to effective, resilient, and collaborative systems? What is the key to meaningful and accessible product experiences? It's profound empathy. Consider empathy when you approach your teams. Think about what you're doing to build the skills and careers of the people with you. Think about what kind of experiences you're producing. Think about whether you are supporting any sort of consequences that you don't intend. When you think about Airbnb, they did, they're working very hard on it right now, but they did introduce ways for people to discriminate against customers in, in their homes. You've got smart thermostats that actually have allowed victims to tunnel in and abuse the people that they were in relationships with. So we have to think about the ways we bring responsible design and empathy to the table. Because it is through empathy that we will build the right kind of customer experiences, the right kind of products, and we will build that human <coughs> connection with the machines and the data that we have. So the choice is yours, the power is yours. Take your skills and go do good. Thank you.